Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So uh, we're about to uh, to start our new session, which is the uh, first Friday of the month. I want to thank everyone uh, to be part of this event with uh, Hillside Wine and Spirit in California and Regency Wine Nevada. Uh, you are my very dear clients, and I really, really appreciate the time of the day today to uh, get to the breakfast of the champions. Breakfast of the champion always start with a glass of wine. That's the uh, tradition in his house. So I want everybody to uh, grab a glass, grab the uh, Provence Rosé Le Sangle, get your uh, glass up. And I want to cheers everyone. And thank you so much to the industry, to this beautiful community. Thank you all to be part of it. And let's have fun today and try to learn much as we can about Rosé which is uh, the campaign that we we're launching today, which is our pre-sale 2020 Vintage Rosé, where we are featuring the uh, Provence Rosé. And as well, we're going to have the chance to uh, meet with Etienne Tenderin. If you never met with him, we've done in a session with him in the past, which is going to be in Santa Barbara and Bilton where he is going to uh, meet us in a half an hour to talk about his rosé made in Santa Barbara. I believe he's going to be at the Bolton line, so we'll have a chance also to see a man in action uh, to, uh, to show us around and what he's doing these days. More people coming in. Thank you again to be here. So today it's all about rosé, so I'm going to do the first uh, presentation, which is uh, obviously uh, Provence, but before we do that, I don't want to forget, this is also the birthday of Smini, our general manager in Reno. Uh, Smini, happy birthday to you, buddy. Uh, that was a heck of a year, but you're here and we're doing that together. Salute and thank you for the support in Northern of Nevada. Uh, here we go. So we're going to start, I believe. Um, so you're welcome to add any, um, any chat. You can uh, ask any question on the side. Ah, here we go, here we go, Mario, just tell me, don't worry about that, guys, you can in and out of this meeting. Let's start with Provence. So Provence Rosé is obviously uh, something that is really uh, happening in the market right now. Actually, we see a huge increase of demand of the Rosé for the past uh, seven years, I should say. Uh, Rosé in general is uh, Provence Rosé, it's obviously southwest of, I mean, south of France. Everybody knows uh, pretty much where it is. I can always put a map uh, on your screen. I send the map to you, but it's always good to have a map on the front of us. It's always a question for me to turn those sharing beautiful presentation together, but there we go. Then everybody has the map, everybody has a question on the map. I'm not going to put that on the screen yet. Okay, so Côte de Provence is about, uh, in hectares, uh, we have about 20, 21,000 hectares in Provence, uh, as far as vineyard, with about uh, 50,000 acres. Uh, the production of Côte de Provence is about a million hectoliters, which is about 122 million balls made, uh, which is a beautiful thing in Provence, is 90%, 91% of the wine made in Provence are rosé which is pretty good to know. So that's why uh, Provence is well known for his rosé, producing rosé for centuries and uh, using the skill of blending uh, with the different uh, key grapes that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, it's about 355 wineries uh, in Provence. Uh, it's about 40 cave cooperative co-op producing and about 24 wine merchant negociant in Provence area. Uh, the, the beautiful uh, scenery of Provence, is, uh, it's all about the, the mountain, but also about the, the uh, Mistral, which is a beautiful, beautiful wind. Then it's hot winds coming from the Mediterranean, then it's creating this uh, very unique terroir and this unique location to grow uh, grapes to make a uh, rosé. Uh, uh, Sainte Victoire, this is where it is. Uh, uh, where the mountain is about. We're going to look at uh, Chateauneuf Le Rouge. So now I need to put the, the map on. Let me do that. Sorry about, just give me a sec here. There was so many different. There is, I just want to show you the map. Where is, there's so many maps. 
<laughs> okay. Let us read the map. I want uh, if everybody can open the map for me. I we're going to see where Chateau Neuf Le Rouge is. That's not the map I want, but that's okay. There we go. That's the one. There we go. So I should have it here. Share the screen, Bruno, share the screen. There we go. Okay, that's the map I want. There we go. Sorry about the technical situation here. So here you have to see. So the whole uh, Provence map is obviously uh, showing you the different part of the Côte de Provence. We're going to reduce that for a sec. So you have the Côte de Provence, which is more on the west. Ooh, technology. There we go. And then you have, uh, uh, you see where is Marseille, you see where is Toulon. And then you have the uh, Coteau de Varrois en Provence in between the uh, Côte de Provence, which is more on the west, and the Côte de Provence in the east. The Côte de Provence in the west, that's what we're talking about, is next to uh, Aix-en-Provence, uh, next to the Palette Appellation. And over here, I'm, go I'm going to extend the map here to show you exactly where Chateauneuf-le-Rouge is. Why Chateauneuf-le-Rouge? Very simple, it's about the terroir as well. You, uh, and the composition of the terroir in Chateauneuf-le-Rouge creates uh, with the iron on the soil, uh, we create the uh, uh, color of red in their soil, which is a, be a beautiful combination of clay, sand, and bauxite. Uh, so it's pretty much uh, iron bauxite, then creating this red soil. And that's what the name of this village is of Chateauneuf Le Rouge. Don't be confused with Chateauneuf du Pape. We're in Provence, not in Rhone. So uh, this beautiful terroir where the uh, domain. La Galinière, then we're producing this cuvee for the past 15 years, uh, is uh, located. This is 100% estate. This is also 100% uh, sustainable. It's uh, the vineyard is uh, organic and certified organic since 2014. Uh, the uh, winemaker is uh, Fabrice Arcari, that's making the wines for all these years with us. So you can see this location is prime to make a perfect rosé. Uh, and uh, Chateau Le Song, I mean, the Cuvée Le Song is something we start 15 years ago at uh, Hillside Wine in Spirit and Regency. It's a cuvée that I create with La Galinière. Uh, <clears throat> was about uh, the location, but also the technique and also the grapes. So I'm going to review that with you. Le Sangle name, the cuvée name, is actually the name of the mountain, of the plateau behind uh, the property. So that's why I decided to, uh, to go with the name of Le Sangle 15 years ago. Uh, Le Sangle was uh, a demand of, of us going after La Galinière and knowing that they have old vine sensor. So obviously we all know then uh, uh, Provence wine is made with different grapes, the typical ones are Obviously, the uh, Grenache, the Syrah, uh, Mouvret, some of the time that we use, and Senso, uh, also very uh, unique to have Tibourin on some of the Provence wine you find in the market. But really, the, uh, the grape that I'm very intriguing about is uh, the Senso. I believe that Provence wine with uh, the addition of the senso, with the combination with Grenache and Syrah, make a way better, a way more longer strength of the wine. So when I met with the uh, property Chateau La Galinière about 18 years ago, I find right away that they were, uh, then they have amazing location for senso. So I told them to make uh, this rosé, this special cuvee for us with more, mer uh, more senso in the, in a cuvee. So the combination of what we usually do, that's the case for uh, 2020 uh, vintage, then it's going to arrive, by the way, by uh, April 8th, or so we can be in a position to release the product by April 15th. Uh, 
The combination of this uh, 2020 vintage is going to be 50% Grenache. Uh, we did uh, about last year, 30% Senso and 20% Syrah. As you can see, a huge amount of Senso, a, a higher, higher percentage of Senso than just a regular Côte de Provence in general. What you have to know is Senso and Tiborin is most of the winery in France will keep the Senso for their top cuvee because Senso really bring over the strength of the wine. Um, so that is uh, why this wine is so unique. And I believe also that's why the people are really uh, uh, digging to it. I mean, our sales obviously last year was a little bit soft because the the situation, but uh, in 20, the vintage 2019, we score about 5,000 cases that we import directly from the winery to you guys. This one is mostly in restaurants. Uh, we sell about 90% of this uh, quantity was sold to the, uh, our own premises program and some of our key account retailer. So the demand is there. The consumer knows about this label for the past 15 years, and we're very pleased to bring it back over uh, this year again. Um, on April 8, that's what the ATA is, we'll have 500 cases, 450 cases are uh, going to be imported, and we're going to ship about uh, 400 cases every month until the end of the summer. So plenty of wine that I took position on just to be sure that we have enough uh, rosé for the rest of the summer. What we do is we try to do a pre-sale today with you guys to be sure that we know exactly your uh, intent and trying to see if you do like the product, if you can use it in your program to help us to define as well the forecast for the summer. So very important for you to take position. We're not going to talk about prices right now because uh, that's not what we do. We do that at the end of the session, but please try to give me an answer as soon as possible as we cannot be organized uh, to have enough wine for the rest of the summer for you guys. Uh, going back to, uh, to Provence, um, Provence region um, really making a statement for Rosé and the Rosé uh, sold uh, in general from Provence, which uh, which is uh, amazing. We have the first conception of rosé in, 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 in the world is the Frenchy drinking their Provence rosé. And then you have the US. US is about 45% of the whole export business of rosé from Provence going to the US. Uh, so we're in the second place, but we're in the first place regarding value and also dollar consumed on rosé. So it looks like we're drinking better rosé from Provence in the US than we do in France, or definitely uh, putting our money to it. So the, cons the consumers are really digging to the rosé. And I believe it's just in general that you see such an increase of demand and conception of rosé. So I know that some of your market are a bit soft still on rosé, like Las Gas, but that's something that I believe will change. People will drink rosé in California. I believe we'll go to Vegas over the weekend will definitely ask for the rosé are they drinking so much in California and this I mean this is this is obvious then every single wine should have a rosé at least a Provence rosé or their winest um, it's a lot of more expensive rosé in, in the market uh, because they're putting so much money on marketing and advertising we're not going to mention any uh, name or any brand but we're not doing that here at Hillside. What we concentrate is we put all the marketing dollars to the glass, meaning to the quality of the wine. We don't spend our money on advertising. Our advertising is you guys talking about the product to your consumers to get access to those wines at a very attractive price for everyone to make money. Uh, what else can we talk about uh, in, uh, in Provence? Uh, it's a, definitely a $2 billion business called the Provence Rosé, a $2 billion um, a business. And it's about uh, $25 million of hectoliters are consumed uh, during, uh, in the world of Rosé. This is, this is the place. Uh, if you do have Rosé on your wine list, I believe uh, Provence Rosé make a statement. And uh, it's just a question for you to find out which Rosé from Provence you like. That's why we, today we are uh, uh, showing you the uh, Le Song uh, from Chateau La Galinière, which is sustainable. Um, so 
let's uh, maybe, uh, if you have any question about Provence, I'm trying to give you some numbers. I'm trying to give you a little uh, map about what Provence is about and Rosé. Uh, maybe what we can talk about for a minute is the different way to make Rosé. Everybody understand and is a two different uh, wine making for Rosé. So <clears throat> the first, the first uh, uh, technique then uh, the people can use to make Rosé uh, and I believe most of the amateur, the people not making rosé for not for too long time will go with this because it's a little bit easier to be made, is to do a pre-fermented cold sting, uh, uh, cold sting uh, uh, maceration. That's uh, usually what uh, some people do. They take the, uh, uh, the, the, the grapes, uh, they uh, go to uh, the delayed they delay the fermentation to bring the product in a low temperature from 10 to 14 degrees Celsius. Um, they, uh, they, they slow down the, uh, the fermentation to release uh, the pigmentation. Then they are coming from the skin. Most of those grapes obviously red. Uh, after a few hours, this uh, skin is going to release uh, the pigmentation to the juice. And those people will put those juice on the side and then they will mix the juice to a free run from their tank. That's what we call the pre-fermentation cold skin maceration. Um, those rosé will have a tendency to be a bit more darker. Um, and obviously in my test, it will be more uh, less in, in characteristic. Uh, the very much rosé that I like to present today, especially the song is a direct press rosé. Direct press rosé. It's a little bit more technical uh, to be made. Uh, obviously, you take the very small fresh berry. Uh, you want to be sure that the berry are not uh, not any mold. Then they are very fresh. Uh, they're not uh, mush. You want to have a very beautiful full berry, and then you will slowly you will start the uh, a moderate press uh, with the skin release the pigmentation as well. Uh, you will do that in a very delicate way until you get the pink color that you're looking for with the winemaker. And I usually where I like to see my rosé to be a little bit more pale uh, in color. And that's why I believe the le, le sang rosé that you have in front of you um, uh, showing today. Then the, contra the control temperatures will be higher than the uh, cold skin maceration. You go 14, 18 degrees Celsius. And then what we do is we press uh very very slowly until you get to fermentation and after about four it's a bit depend between three to ten days some people do a long uh, macerate uh, fermentation 10 days this is not the case over here we only do 40 48 hours two days on this one um and it's going to be released on the stainless steel vat or on the concrete vat in this case we do a stainless steel with le song uh, that's the way the uh, the uh, cuvee was made. Uh, the most difficult thing to do at the end, and that's why uh, we we love to see a, a winemaker like uh, Fabrice doing that for the past uh, 30 years now at La Galiniere, uh, is uh, the talent to make the blending at the end a perfect combination. And over here, we talk about this uh, combination. I like the 50% uh, Grenache, my 30% Senso, and my 20% Syrah, then it's blend at the end and it's creating this amazing combination of strength and uh, delicatissem uh, flavor. Uh, blending is the key on the direct press. It is the most difficult and the most accurate, I believe, way to make rosé. And that's why I'm very happy to have Le Song to be made this for our 15 vintage on Le Song. Uh, I hope I was not really too details. I'm trying to cover the different uh, part of uh, uh, the meeting here where to have a better understanding about rosé and how to define the best rosé for your program. Um, we're testing the rosé right now. I am not going to do this one because I already know this rosé already selected and already bring it over. It's already on the water. Uh, but I'm going to have someone to tell me what they think about this rosé and, uh, and let me know. Uh, let me know what you think. Our speaker, I'm going to, why did I have this one? Gallery view, there we go. Hello, hello everyone. Is anybody want to take the lead on 
de Provence, le sangle rosé. You can say le sangle, you can say le sangle. Uh, doesn't matter to me. Uh, both are pretty good uh, to, uh, to pronounce. Uh, as anybody, so you know the name of the game. It looks like I'm going to wait for someone to uh, to take the lead and to uh, describe this uh, rosé for us. Anybody, 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 anybody. So you want, aha, ah, Mindy, Mindy, I see a little hand was waving for a sec. <laughs> Go ahead, Mindy. I'm going to unmute uh, you just to be sure that we can hear for what you have to say. Uh, can you ask, I mean, can you unmute just Ari? No, again. There we go. You're right here. Good morning. Good morning. Got outside for the occasion. I'm excited about Rosé's uh, season. This is just a really pretty pale color. I love the pale. It's surprising how strong the aromatics are, even though it's so pale. That's what struck me right away. Um, I'm getting a really pretty melon character, followed by honey, and then I get a soft green note. It's almost like a celery salt. So it reminds me, my mom used to salt her watermelon in the in the summertime, so it's bringing back good summertime memories. Uh, it's beautiful. I didn't expect so many aromatics with the pale color, so thank you. That's great. It's a great uh, flashback for myself too. My grandmother used to put salt on my uh, on my Guadalupe melon, and it's definitely remind me about this. Uh, even the color um, will will be very close to that. Uh, thank you for the description, um, Diane. I don't know if anybody did get any cheese, but you're the cheese queen, and we would like to find out um, more about what you have to say about this rosé, and maybe uh, have a suggestion for us uh, uh, on the on the pairing. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me again. Um, hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> um, so when I first had this rosé, I mean, one of the first things I think about as a cheesemaker um, is herbs de Provence, because it's something that we use in cheesemaking a lot. Um, sometimes when we are marinating fresh chev and oil, we'll add some herbs de Provence in that. Um, and so I wanted to actually go with that sort of herbal characteristic that's notable from that region from a cheese making standpoint. And although I didn't stick with a French made cheese, I stuck with a very herbaceous cheese today. So I'm going to see if I can move my camera and you can see my cheeses here. Oh, wow. um, this is Cabra Romero. Cabra Romero here is from the Marica region of Spain. This is a semi-soft goat's milk cheese, um, notable for the breed of goat that's used to make this cheese. So um, native to the Marica region, you have a breed of goat called Muricana goats. Muricana goats have an ideal milk composition for cheese making. They have a beautiful butter fat, beautiful protein content in that milk, and it's known to be a rather like gentle sort of goat's milk that's a really nice way to introduce you to some of the properties you expect like tart like bright like acidic from a goat's milk but in a more like gentle easy friendly way so um what we actually did here is we paired the provence rosé with the cabra romero um, and when you actually mix the two together you'll find that the cultured cream note from that goat's milk comes right forward on the palate and also extrapolates the herbal properties that do exist in the wine and brings them very forward while the cream sits deep and it finishes lovely and bright on the palate as well um, so this is a beautiful pairing for me. I really enjoyed it. When I pair cheese and wine together, I like to introduce my palate to the cheese first. I make sure that I really chew the cheese nicely and then push my tongue up along the roof of my mouth towards the back of my top teeth to really activate the retronasal cavity and allow myself to taste a lot more of those components of the goat's milk. Um, and then I'll introduce the wine after I've sort of saturated my palate with the goat's milk cheese. So do it both ways. Do wine first and then do cheese first and notice how the pairing changes. But either way you introduce it, it's really a good pairing. It's a fun one for me. Fantastic, Diane. Always very, very well details and very well presented. I really appreciate that. Diane is the owner of the uh, cheese store in Anderson uh, Valley uh, in Las Vegas. If for everyone going to Vegas or everyone is already in Vegas, please visit Diane at her store. She has amazing selection and she always do a great job regarding the pairing with our wine. Thank you again. Really of appreciate course. it. Of course. Yeah. Thanks. And for those of you who have the pairing, let me know how you're feeling about it because 
I had a lot of fun with this one. I'm always very excited for it to get warmer outside. So I like, I'm very playful with my pairings in this season. That sounds great. Really appreciate that again. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone want to add anything to this Le Sang de Rosé before we get to uh, Etienne in Santa Barbara? Anyone? Yes, Karen. Karen, good morning. I see you waving. Sorry, so many different screens this morning. I'm trying to get every, to everyone. So go ahead, Karen. Go for it. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. A little mic on the side. Okay. There we go. Okay, You're here. So this was a, this is so delicious, um, Bruno and Smitty. Hi, Smitty. Good morning. Hello, Smitty. <laughs> Um, so I'm getting raspberry, beautiful key lime notes, an amazing, delicious amount of acid, and it pairs wonderful with my lobster frittata. Lobster in the morning, why not? Lobster in the morning, sugar <laughs> in the evening, it all works out. <laughs> Thank you, Karen is uh, Vino 100 in Reno. Um, thank you so much for the support. I know we've done the Rosé uh, Le Song in the past, the last year together, and hopefully we continue to do it this year. And I uh, really appreciate the feedback. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, if, if anybody comes to Reno, please come visit at Vino 100. I'd love to meet all of you in person. And Karen is always an uh, amazing host. She does such a great job at her uh, little wine bar over there inside the store of Vino 100 in Reno. Please visit Karen. She's a great supporter of our portfolio. Thank you so much again. Bruno, we just had our 10 year anniversary on Monday. Congratulations. Exciting. We so made exciting. it COVID. It's a, yeah, it's good. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate Thank that. You. You're a part of it, Bruno, and you too, Smitty. Thank you. It takes a, it takes a whole team. It, it does. Yeah, cheers, it, you guys. cheers to that. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Let's continue to have fun at your store and um, I will be there at the end of this month. So hopefully I can see you and we can share a glass of wine together. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, everyone, um, it's exactly what we're doing in this session as well. You're welcome to know each other. You're welcome to meet each other on the chat box. Uh, you're welcome to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to share any news that you have for your business as well. We're a community. We're here to help each other. Uh, very well. Anybody want to add anything to the Rosé Le Song? Are we good with this, uh, with this product? Everybody get a good uh, sense about what Provence is, how Rosé is made, and uh, a little bit more about our special Cuvée Le Song from Chateau La Galinière, sustainable Rosé wine. I do have, I believe, somewhere on the screen, uh, my dear friend, uh, Etienne. Etienne, I'm, you're right here. Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you pretty good. I can actually good. see you, but I can hear Better. you. Are we going to have a chance to have your video on? Let's see. Uh... So just uh, before Etienne tried to figure out how his video is working, I just want to be sure then, uh, then you have the second wine open. It's right here. This is the uh, Cordon. Uh, we're going to put that on the- Cuvée Rouge. This, voila. This is our Cordon. This is the uh, new release. Uh, this is the uh, 2020 Cuvée Cordon Santa Barbara. Over here, we do have Etienne. I thought he was going to be at the Bolton line, but he's in the car. Oh, you are the Bolton line. Okay, good, 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 good. Well, thank you so much to be here, Etienne, again. Uh, please introduce yourself to everyone. Uh, let them know about your program that you have called Cordon of Santa Barbara. Tell them about the passion beyond. Tell them about how you make this uh, beautiful rosé. And uh, again, thank you to be here. Go ahead. Thank you, Bruno. So we're going to do a little walking tour um, of the winery because we're bottling today. But again, my name is Etienne Trelinden. I focus on wines made in Santa Barbara County only. And uh, we have a great uh, region, great geography. We have the only east-west mountain range in North America that allows a lot of marine, cool marine air to come in and flow. Um, last time I did this Zoom meeting, I was in the vineyard and we had a hawk you know, do its thing in the background. I don't know if gonna, this is going to happen because we're at the winery now today, but okay. um, I will walk and 
Yeah, the connection is not good. Go inside the winery, yeah. Um, and we put the bottles. A quick, a quick ferment and to keep that nice, bright fruit, bottle it young and release it for the springtime. It's a, it's a Grenache. So it's, it's a rosé of Grenache. And um, aged in stainless steel and bottled right there. So it has a really nice bubblegum note. And I have a little bottle here with me. And I don't know if you can see, but all the stainless steel tanks. We have the truck in the background, the bottling truck. And I'll walk you through the bottling truck. And then all our stainless steel tanks, our presses, forklifts. And right now the crew's on break, but I'm gonna walk around to the truck and explain how the truck works. Hopefully everyone's sipping the wine while we do this. Yeah, everybody has a glass of wine. Everybody's sipping the glass. Can you tell us if you do a pre-fermentation cold skin maceration or if you do a, a direct press rosé? So here's the bottling truck, this bottling crew, bottle meister company that we use. And this is the Cuvée Rouge that we're bottling right now. Nice. That is the... Uh, 2019 Cube Rouge. You can see the labels are on the, the labeler. Files will come right by here and get put on. Here we have the boiler that puts the foils on. As you see, it's rotating. Here we have the corker, corking machine and the filler. So right now, everyone's on break. Otherwise, you'd be seeing it in action. Filling, corking, foiling, and then labeling. So that's the truck. It's a semi. As you can see, it's a huge semi truck that backs up to the winery. These machines are a million dollars. So it doesn't really make sense for me to have my own machine. So we use a truck, we contract them, and they come bottle for us and then they leave and they're very professional and the quality is very good 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 let's go back thank you so much for the tour uh, i thought that was going to be we thought with etienne it's going to be a great thing to have you uh, just looking at the bottling line just for the people didn't see that for well the people didn't see it at all so we thought it was good to have that in the background trying to find the scenery a little bit uh, when we do those uh, zoom trade testing um Let's go back to uh, the rosé, please, Etienne. Let's really okay. uh, understand the way that you're making the rosé and tell us about the technique. Are you using a pre-fermented cold skin maceration or are you doing a rosé with the uh, direct press? So we're doing the rosé direct press. So we pick the grapes at optimal ripeness for rosé. That means low pH, high acid, but still has some nice fruit to it. We pick it, we'll bring it in. I will foot stomp the grapes in the picking bins and break the skin open, let the color come out of the skin and sit on the skins for about an hour. A little bit of color comes out. If I did it for too long, it would be like a red wine. Like 24 hours, it would be red. All the pigment would come out of the skin. So we just do one hour. Then I dump it into these presses and right behind me is a big press. And in that press, there's a bladder. And then I press it for about an hour and I squeeze all the juice out of uh, basically the tinted wine that had a little bit of skin contact. The juice will come out rosé color. It'll go into these tanks behind me, this big tank, and I will set the temperature down to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And now slowly ferment the wine. And it takes about two months to ferment the rosé, very slow, and it keeps and captures that fruit, that bright fruit. So if you're tasting it right now, like I am, smelling it, a lot of bubble gum, a lot of like Jolly Rancher note. It's a very, very fruity wine, very aromatic because that slow cold ferment. And uh, it's just a very fun, nicely chilled. It's a great spring or summer sipper. What is the breakdown on the nice Grenache? Body. On the on the on the grapes, which grape do you use? 
We do a Grenache Noir. It's a Grenache that's grown here in St. Inez. And um, it's a vineyard called Bella Cavalli, which is right down the road from us. We farm it. And um, it's ideal. It's right in the heart of St. Inez. So it's 100% Grenache? There's a little bit of Syrah in there. I put in there just to give a little bit of tweaking of the color. Otherwise, it would have been too light. So I'll have a great Syrah from uh, White Hawk Vineyard that I had a little bit in there just to tweak the color to give it a nice hue. So and, we, can uh, say, we can say 95% Grenache, 5% uh, Syrah? You say 98% Grenache, 2%. It was actually 2% Syrah. Got very it. small. Got it. Very small. Now... Can you just tell me why you're not doing so much? I mean, why this production is only 100 cases? Well, the vineyard only produces that much. I mean, the vineyard, I, I'd like to speak out more, but, you know, the vineyard's small. It's a family-owned um, vineyard owned by the Lockwood family. Uh, we farm it for them. And they make some uh, Grenache for their little production, but then I take the rest for my rosé. And that's all the, the vineyard can bear. But... Um, 100 no. cases made only. Okay, so I guess uh, I already committed. I'm going to get 75 cases because I have to leave you 25 cases for the testing room. So uh, everyone just jump on it if you can, because that's going to be very, very quick. It's not a product that we're going to have, I believe, all summer because obviously it's going to be a, such a limited amount of cases made. But uh, it is available now, meaning that the product is already in the warehouse. When did you done the bottling? Uh, we did the bottling, uh, was it January? Yeah, it's okay. in the warehouse. It was and earlier It was earlier than the year before? Uh, no, it's about the same time. You know, the, the goal with the rosé is to keep it bright and fruity and then bottle it right away. It's not going to benefit from aging longer like a red wine in barrel. We try to get it right in, you know, in bottle. Like, kind of like a Beaujolais kind of style. You can see, you can taste that fruitiness, but then the finish has nice acidity, kind of nice mid potty. Um, mid palate body, but it's not sweet. It's very fruity, very aromatic, but it's not a sweet wine. It's dry. Uh, what, uh, which bricks did you pick up your grapes to do a rosé like that? 21 bricks. 21, 21 bricks. Yeah. So a little yeah. bit earlier, obviously, a little bit earlier than what you do for your red wines. That's right. Absolutely. We try to maintain that acidity and uh, not overripe. So it's, um, yeah, 21 bricks. And then the alcohol stays low. So the alcohol is around 13%, below 13% in that little area. So you don't want a very hot, you know, overly ripe rosé. You want something with balance, acidity, and texture. That you sounds know. great. It's a That's great balance great. between the fruitiness, the fruitiness, the mid-palate, the four-palate, and that nice finish. I mean, when it's chilled down on a hot summer day, it's it's almost like, uh, I don't know, like, like, almost like it's like soda pop almost. It's kind of just super fruity. I love it. We're going to have someone to do the description. Thank you so much, Etienne, to uh, to give us. Uh, stay with us for, for a minute. We're going to, uh, yeah. so this is our Santa Ines Valley. This is Cuvée Rosé. Uh, again, uh, Cordon of Santa Barbara, Etienne Ternerin, the owner. Uh, Etienne background, obviously, was a uh, head winemaker for the tea shop for 20, 25 years. He also have his own label in his own facility in Bulton. If you visit uh, Santa Barbara, Bulton, Solvang area, please don't hesitate to reach out for him or through us uh, because he is, he's just a great uh, tour guide and he's giving us always a great uh, presentation <laughs> of his wine. There we go. That's the paint bottle. Some artist going through your winery sometime. Yeah. Huh? That's great. Um, Etienne I, is, any artist is, is invited to the winery. Any artist can come to the winery. I'll have a barrel for you to paint. Come out, hang yeah. out. And if you're That's a big great. buyer, I have a guest house here in Santa Barbara for you. That's right. You have a little guest house over there, a little apartment that uh, we can use when we're overnight. Uh, let us know in advance if you're traveling this size of the of the city. And uh, we definitely we're going to hook you up with Etienne. Etienne is a producer of Sauvignon Blanc from Happy Canyon, a Pinot Noir from Santa Rita Hills, uh, a beautiful uh, Cordon Red Blend and is doing the bottling right now. Uh, we also do uh, a Syrah from the White Oak Vineyard, and uh, he's just amazing, passionate winemaker, as you can see. So uh, let's support the small grower and the small producer. Cordon is all made from Santa Barbara, as you can understand, and it's definitely a small production. Each product or each flavor are producing from 150 to 200 cases each flavor. So it's very limited, but it's a program that we are building step by step with Etienne. 
And uh, I just uh, love what he's doing. So thank you again, Etienne. Let's have someone yeah. to uh, give us uh, a little descriptive about this, uh, this rosé right here. Obviously, uh, a pretty large difference, I believe, for what we test with the uh, Le Song. And that was also the purpose of putting those two rosé next to each other. I believe it brings a little difference. And I think it can be also good for your wine. So you have a Provence rosé style and you have uh, obviously a, a, a wine made the same way, but in a different uh, continent in California and Santa Barbara. Um, I would love to hear some of you guys. The ladies always have going and give me all the great uh, feedback. I know Kat is, is, is jumping on her chair. She wants to talk about this rosé, but we're going to uh, give the credit of the doubt and find out if one, you, one of you guys can actually take the leads. Come, come on, don't be shy. The ladies are not shy. The guy cannot just be shy. We want to take the leads. Tell me. I, 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 I see, I see, I see, I see. Jason. Jason, good morning, buddy. Good morning, good morning, good morning. You know me, I'll always talk. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, I, I love seeing the difference between the two. Um, going back to the Cote de Provence, the minerality in that really stood out after trying the, uh, the rosé from Santa Inez. Um, but then going back to the Santa Inez, uh, obviously when, when he was talking about that bubblegum note uh, and Jolly Rancher and orange peel and all that really expressive fruit, um, sweet fruit that you get from, from the, the, the California wines, I, I think it's, it stays true uh, to, its, to its region. It also has just such great balance. Uh, I mean, both of these wines, um, even as different as they are stylistically, the, the balance between acidity and body and, and texture, I think is what really makes these wines just so easy to drink a lot of, which is going to make my morning really short. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if I can Uber my kids to school. I don't know. Um, but no, I, I, I find it, uh, my favorite note about the entire thing is, is the balance of the acidity. It's just so clean and lovely, but still well textured in, 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 as far as mouthful goes. It's probably my favorite thing about the wine. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let us know again where 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 is your job. Tell everyone what you do uh, in Las Vegas. Me? I, I'm a I'm a homeschool teacher. Okay, great. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I work at Prime Steakhouse of Bellagio. Thank you. So everybody is uh, going to Vegas. Please visit our friend Jason at the uh, Prime Steakhouse in Bellagio. Uh, always been a huge supporter of our program and our portfolio. Thank you so much, Jason, to be part of our community. Appreciate that. Really do. Thank you, bro. Thanks. Uh, is anybody else? Um, I would love to get now a sense. Yes, Kat. I love your descriptive, Kat. I'm not going to do my normal goofiness. No? Uh, maybe. We'll see. I'm, I'm Okay, I'm just going to say... There's three of us on here in Las Vegas that uh, are opening a new wine bar because I'm going to shout it out because I'm very excited and proud. And uh, it's called Ada's Wine Bar. And we did our soft, it was not soft, opening last evening. And um, so I feel like I'm 120, not even like 100. It's 120 years old today. So thanks for the indulgence this morning. But I really, I, I got a shout out to Diana with this wine, the, the Cordon Rosé and this Chez, it's effing amazing. Um, I will not disappoint everyone without a curse here, but it's just so much of the best pairing that I've had. Um, I mean, all the cheese pairings that we've done so far have been great, but this really complemented the wine so very much that it created this, it's like the breath in, and then the breath out, and there's this wondrous flow and symmetry between the the flavors of the, the wine and then the complements of this texture and cheese. So that, I, that's the best I can do right now because I'm 120 right now. So <laughs> congratulations on the uh, opening uh, of the new location. Yep. Tell us the name again for everyone. So it's Ada's Wine Bar. It's in Tivoli Village in Summerlin, and we are officially opening to the rest of the world tomorrow at 2 p.m. So. That's right. Gr congratulations, guys. I'm so, so proud of you and so happy for you guys. We definitely, uh, next time I'm going to be in Vegas, I really hope very soon 
I will I will definitely stop by and I have a glass with you guys. Thank we you again for the support. That. And Sarah and Jody are both on here and there are other wine goddesses that are uh, joining in the space with me. So shout out to them too. Cheers, guys. Thank you again. Thank you again, Kat. Appreciate that. Anyone, anyone, anyone want to add anything to this beautiful presentation? I believe then... The, Diana, uh, Diana, the cheese. Diana, yes, Milan, I will talk about cheese. Um, so, <laughs> um, Bruno, is that okay? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so, I was waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kat, thank you for that lovely um, summary there. I, um, I tasted this wine and it just... it it screamed this cheese to me. Like both of these pairings that were brought to me, when I tasted the wine, it was not even a thought in my head. It was like an immediate, this cheese goes here, this cheese goes here. Um, the reason I chose the Midnight Moon, this is Midnight Moon, it's a goat's milk Gouda. Um, so production for Midnight Moon was originally in Northern California. Um, again, goat's milk, alternative milks, we're going for like springtime tones, springtime flavors here. Midnight Moon is a Gouda style that is made with goat's milk. Goudas, when they're made, go through like a cook step. Cooking the curd in a Gouda actually sweetens it a little bit. So you'll notice that in this cheese, it gives you like a little bit of a heavier body. It gives you uh, that still sort of cultured cream note that is expressive of goat's milk, but you also get a lovely sort of nutty, sweet salinity that beautifully balances with this wine. There are a lot of like ripe fruit notes in the wine for me and goat's milk is an easy pairing to choose for that. But because as mentioned previously, it has a little bit of a bigger body. It has a little bit of a texture to the wine. I wanted to mirror that in the cheese selection, give you a cheese with a bigger body and a smoother mouthfeel that would really coat the palate. Um, give you a little bit of a granularity from early tyrosine formation. This Gouda is aged six months minimum to about a year. So you'll get a different variations of granularity there, that's tyrosine, it's an amino acid that sort of creates those lovely crystals you find in aged cheeses. Um, but goudas are notably a little bit more sweet, especially as they age. So this one is very, I mean, it just plays beautifully with the fruit forward notes in the wine. Um, the body mirrors that of the rosé. It's just, um, and these recipes both originated in California. So Midnight Moon was originally from Northern California. Production moved to Holland. Goats don't produce that much milk. You don't want to strain your girls. You'd rather move your production and strain your kids. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, productions moved to Holland where they know how to do Gouda, you know, um, and it's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful dance of flavor between the two, I think. So that's why I chose it. That's great. Again, just amazing, uh, amazing job regarding those descriptive. And thank you again to do the pairing with us. And again, you are in Anderson Valley. You are in Anderson in Las Vegas. Please visit the uh, cheese store uh, when you visit Vegas or when you're already in Vegas, you're looking for great cheese. You know where to find it now. Thank you again. Appreciate that. Thanks for having me. You, you're welcome. Um, anyone, anyone else want to add anything to this uh, comment? Maybe tell me uh, if you want to tell me. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, my friend Jeffrey, go for it. Uh, I just had a quick question regarding the RS levels in these two wines. If you happen to know, and I know we have Etienne on here, so I'm sure you can tell us the Cordon, because um, yeah. that certainly is not bone dry. I'm guessing it's right around 10 or so, but. Etienne, oh, he's on the bottling line. We have a question for you, Etienne. Can you hear me? He's showing us the bottling line, which is pretty loud. <laughs> we all know that. Uh, it's Maybe it's online. Etienne? Yeah. Etienne. Etienne, we have a quick question for you. Can you tell us the uh, RS on your rosé, please? I, you know, you're not going to believe it, but it's completely dry. It's completely dry. So what is it? Nope, I don't believe it. I know, <laughs> but it has so much fruitiness and, and finish. It's dry. It's dry. So what is it? Do you know the, the, the RS 10? There's no RS. It's it's considered dry. It's it's less than like like a tenth of a percent. There's no residual sugar. Okay, I guess it's uh, super fruit profile, but there's no sweetness. It has a perceived sweetness because it's very fruity, but it's dry. It's dry. Okay, that sounds great. I know I'm that bring, my... I'm going to bring you over the bowling line so you can see the, the I'm doing the Cuvée Rouge right now. Okay, I'm going to show you it's in action. So here he goes. There we go. 
foils. We're putting the foils on. Let's see by the Here's the labeler. You can see the labels are coming off. And then they go on the bottle right here. Come through there. And off they go. Okay. Now let me show you the corker. I'm going to show you the corker. Okay. This corker. Right. That sounds great. Thank you so much for chance to give us the little tour, everybody. Uh, I'm pretty sure I appreciate and we have a little uh, live uh, background with something happening at the winery. Every day something's happening at the winery. So thank you again, Etienne. Really appreciate the report. Really appreciate uh, that you're here today to tell us about your, uh, your, uh, your rosé wine. Uh, again, the bottling of the uh, wine that he's talking about right now is that we're Grenache Base Red Blend with Syrah, uh, a little bit touch of Mouret called the, the Red Blend. If you never have this one, just check it out. It's just a great Cuvée wine. Rouge. Le Cuvée Rouge. Côte d'Iron Rouge Cuvée. Anyhow, anybody want to add anything? Syrah, to Grenache, Mourvedre. You got it. Thank you, Etienne. I appreciate that. Thank you again. Yeah. Um, is anybody want to uh, add anything to this meeting this morning? I, I know we're reaching out for the hour. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I really appreciate the uh, the, the, the follow up and the, 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 the present this morning. I'm just going to wait for a minute to see if there's any question. If not, I'm going to go to what's everybody I believe waiting for is maybe the price. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to put the chat box right here in case I didn't see did anybody have, did I have a question? Did we answer all your questions, guys? We good? Okay, dokie. Uh, I am going now to share the uh, spices. I want to thanks before we do that. I want to thanks everyone to be part of this meeting this morning. Uh, it, it's really uh, it's great to uh, to uh, to be on the community. I want to thanks uh, um, every uh, every person in my organization, which is Regency Wine Nevada and Hillside. Uh, to make this happen with us. And um, I also need to thank uh, Domaine uh, Chateau La Galinière Le Song to support the program as well with Etienne, giving us some samples for us to uh, enjoy this breakfast of the champion. Again, thank you so much. Don't forget, it's going to be once a month. So the next uh, meeting is going to be the first Friday of next month of April. We'll let you know in advance what's going to happen and yeah. what kind of line we're going to feature to this event. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bruno, thank you. Going out because we're going to have um, uh, the prices that we're going to announce the prices uh, yes. in a minute. Bruno, Bruno, thank